Hi, this is Michael Uslan. You're listening to Batman on Film. I'm vengeance. I have given a name to my pain. And welcome to this episode, number 190 of the Batman on Film podcast. BOF is the sponsor and a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network. Check out all of the shows over at batmanpodcastnetwork.com and follow us on Twitter at Batpod Network. I'm Garrett Grev. Welcome to the Batcave. You can follow me on Twitter at Garrett Wado. And you can email me topics, suggestions, feedback at garrett.grev at batmanonfilm.com. As always, thank you for listening. Now, listeners, you know that here in the Batcave over the next few months, we've talked about this. We are going to be highlighting episodes that are getting us pumped, getting us amped up for next March and the release of The Batman. So we are going to be focusing on a series of podcasts where we are revisiting influential stories on Matt Reeves' upcoming Batman motion picture. So along with those stories, we're also going to be highlighting specific character episodes where we're looking at iterations of those characters that will be in the upcoming sure-to-be blockbuster motion picture. Now, tonight, I'm very pleased to bring you the second installment of our character feature episodes. So way back in March, we did a prototype episode focused on the Catwoman episodes that are probably best known from Batman the Animated Series. Um, BOF senior contributors Peter Vera and Ryan Haas joined me for those. And I've got a guest with me tonight. I think it's very apropos that he's actually on this episode with this character. One, he chose the character, so that makes sense. But if I were to tell him, hey, pal, I would like you to do a character as we get ready for the Batman, and the character I would really like you to do is this character, well, this would be the man I picked for the job. Yes, I am talking about the enigmatic egoist, the prince of puzzlers, the Riddler, is the topic of tonight's conversation, but I cannot wouldn't be safe to do it, study this villain alone. No, I need a partner in crime down here, and I am pleased to welcome back to the BOF podcast, the man who straddles the line between two states, the master of Mountain Dew flavor variants, the librarian of the Batman Book Club, and the man whose pecs fill out a T Public podcast shirt better than anyone else in geekdom, that is BOF senior contributor, Ryan Lauer. Welcome back, Lauer, spelled like lower. Joy! Gasm. Joy, gasm. Wow, what an what an intro. Uh it's all downhill from here, folks. Oh, falsehoods um, and lies. My goodness. Uh it, I was totally not trying to make the connection, but I did wear green today. Wow. So I guess I guess I'm ready for this, you know? I, question mark, man. It's, question. it's it's very appropriate for many reasons uh, that that you asked me on for this character specifically because I know that I mean you're you're running the show here. I chose the Riddler and you you allowed it. You Mills laned me. Celebrity Deathmatch, way throwback. Um, <laughs> way, yeah, for the way back. <laughs> for those claymation fans in the audience. Yeah, uh, but I said the Riddler because for I mean many reasons I. I love the character. Um, He's duking it out with Scarecrow as my second favorite villain in Gotham City. Um, I I was a Jim Carrey super fan at the time that Batman Forever came out. And the fact that he played the Riddler and the way he played the Riddler just sang to me. Garrett just took a sip out of a 1995 Riddler Batman Forever mug. Yeah, it's glass. Um, glass from they don't McDonald's. Make collectibles like this anymore. They do not. I have those in my. You know this. This uh, is fine we, china. We talk about it all the time. This is beautiful stuff that I use all the time still, and it has survived over a hundred trips in the dishwasher. 
Uh, and, and it's still, even the thin, the thin uh, handle on the Riddler glass is still intact on both. Rock of my solid. Hands. It's right it's there. Great. Uh, all of that. Just saying, thank you, Garrett, for lo- allowing me to come on the BOF podcast to talk the Riddler. Well, you know, Ryan, first of all, thank you for coming back. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, but you have got, I, you know, when I think about like, who would I really want to have on to talk about these characters? Who do I think, you know, one has a love of them, understands them, appreciates their history, but just sort of embodies what they're all about. Like your cousins. Riddler, yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cousins. <laughs> just a nice, polite man who lives in Minnesota. I hate but he's busy right now. So yeah. yeah. So I had Ryan on instead. Why? Because Ryan is, um, you know, he's a bit of a mischief maker. He's got a prankster sense of humor. You know, you might, th- you might think he's nice and polite fellow Midwestern boy, but Ryan's <laughs> got this like sneaky sense of humor and kind of like this wily demeanor sometimes that pops out. He's a fun loving, t- he's a fun loving guy. And I think that's wonderful. Cause I also am a fun loving guy. We're not going to, you know, have any heists or, um, you know, create any crimes where anybody has to solve puzzles to catch us tonight, but we're going to have a good time. Just like the Riddler likes to have a good time. And Ryan, do you know how I really like, you know, how I really like to have a good time on the podcast? Uh, I have, a, I have a guess. It is with another thrilling edition of God the damn. number one bat trivia <laughs> game sweeping the nation. Yes. What would an episode focus on the Riddler be without a puzzle game? Oh, it'd be pretty boring. So let's get into another installment of the nation's favorite. What up? I want you to tell all your friends about me. <laughs> all right, Ryan, mm. you've played this a number of times. Most, I, have. I think most of the time when you play, you're playing against Peter. Yeah. Uh, Peter's not here tonight. Just mano a mano. So more pressure the, on me. <laughs> yeah. More pressure on you. Um, but that's just fine because we all know when we play this game down here in the bat cave, we're on the bat honor system. That means listeners, you get this in audio. I get this in audio and visual. And I'm going to be asking Ryan a series of questions. Three of oh, those questions are sort of your standard difficulty. Um, oh, sorry, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving him clues. And then he's going to guess, you know, potentially based on what those clues are. Three of those clues are your standard difficulty levels, you know, they're a little bit tricky. They're a little bit puzzly. Uh, Edward Digma would maybe think he could get these pretty easily. The fourth one is a giveaway clue. At this point, any self-respecting Bat fan should raise his hand. And that's what Ryan's going to do. As soon as he knows or believes he knows the answer to these clues, he's going to raise his hand. The sooner he does that, i.e. with fewer clues, the more Bat cred he gets. He's not competing against anybody but himself and his, his own pride tonight. Good. So I will keep you informed and you're going to hear us walk through this. Ryan, are you ready? Sure. All right. So this is a bit <laughs> yeah. of a freebie. It's a freebie. It's kind of a categorical. Tonight, uh, we're talking about a character, but I'm going to give you more than that. Okay. The subject is a sidekick or an accompanying character. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, Ryan. Clue number one. I like this this game. (laughs) (laughs) This this character was introduced in 1955 by Bill Finger and Sheldon Maldoff. What are you? Ryan has a puzzled look on his face. He's shaking his head (laughs) off. He would like one more clue. Clue number two. This character appeared in many of the DC animated original movies that shared the same New 52-inspired continuity in a very minor role each time. What are you? He's shaking his head. He's scratching his head. And we are on to clue number three. Oh, boy. This character had a lengthy absence in comics, lasting from 1964 to 1991. However, a more traditional version of this character didn't arrive again until Batman Rebirth. What are you? Man, these are toughies. Uh, it's, yeah, this is this is tough. I'm not gonna lie; these okay. are toughies, and that's why, listeners, we go to clue number four. And what are you? And this is the giveaway. I I trust Ryan. He's a smart young man. He's gonna get this. Clue number four. He's a very good boy. What yeah. are you? <laughs> 
Okay. Ryan seems he seems like he's got it. What's your answer, sir? Could it be Ace the Bat Hound? It is Ace the Bat Hound. My Ace goodness. introduced in 1955. Ace was written out of continuity in 1964 with nothing more than a brief cameo uh, it, when Julie Schwartz wanted to move the character forward and did not appear again until post crisis 1991, where he was only just a dog hanging out around <laughs> until rebirth. He uh, actually got a mask in a, in the whole deal and a little bit of a new origin on where the name came from. Well, Ryan, well thank you for playing. That was as always, what are you? And now onto the main event. Atomic batteries to power. Well, Bat Boys and Bat Girls, we are eagerly awaiting the release of the Batman. We are, geez, less than four months, about three and a half months out from the big date. Actually, yeah, not even three and a half. We're like three months and three days, as a matter of fact, as of this recording, as I just mentioned, December 1st. And it is wild time. It's crazy. The, count, the countdown is on. I mean, can you yeah. believe it? I can't really believe it. I mean, I'm going to go back and count it myself. December to January, January to That's February, right. February to March. That's three months, three months and three days. Christmas is going to just come up on us. So that disappears right past it. December. Then New Year's. Now we're in Boom. January. NFL season is going to wrap up to playoffs. I mean, that's what we kind of live and breathe. Right. And then we're in February Super Bowl. Uh-huh. In which a couple of weeks after that, the Batman's coming out. Like I got a birthday in January. I've got oh some boy. kids' birthdays smattered around in there too. I don't know. I'm sure a couple of them. We got a trip it, to we got a trip to Dallas to plan too. I still have to buy tickets. We got we to gotta be roomies. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, <laughs> listeners, you may be asking yourselves, what are these guys doing in Dallas together? We're headed out to the Batman on Film watch party. You can find all the details over at uh, Batman on Film proper. That's Batman-on-film.com. Look for the watch party information there. Come watch a movie. Hang out with some cool dudes. Hopefully we're all cool. <laughs> I don't know. You, you figure some it out. Some dudes. If I you mean, don't think we're cool, I guess that's your problem, not mine. I think yeah. we're awesome. <laughs> Just some dudes. There you Just go. Just some dudes. And some ladies. You know, yeah. there'll be some ladies there too. Most of which are probably married to some of those dudes. So don't get any yeah. ideas out there. Yeah, this is not like this is not a party to come pick up your the love of your life. So. Yeah, more than likely <laughs> not. Saying. More than likely not. But anyway, my point is this thing is sneaking up on us fast, and we're going to hit the main characters here. Talk about what we know about them, what we love about them, what we think might show up in this movie, what could show up in this movie, maybe, and what probably won't. And we've got an assortment of quality Riddler tales. Uh, Ryan, I don't know about you, but when I think about the characters we know the least about going into this movie, Riddler's a number one. Well, there's some rumors we won't get into here. You can find them on the internet about characters that may or may not be in the movie that we don't know much about. We're not going to talk about. But of the characters that are confirmed to be in this movie, I firmly believe the Riddler is the character we know the least about how... The, how they're interpreting the character, how Matt Reeves is 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 going to portray that character. Mm -hmm. I I don't know anybody that we know less about. Do you? Uh, of the main, I mean, yeah, yeah. Of the of the big characters, we know to be in it. I mean, maybe maybe Falcone, because we haven't even seen him in fair. Uh, what do you want to say? WB released. Sure. Okayed released uh, stuff that we don't yeah, some know. Spy picks and that's it. Don't know. You can assume because of the character himself, but then also John Turturro playing him that um, that he's not just like a really quick little blurb that he's going to have some kind of play on the story. But I, I just think of, of the big ones, Batman, Catwoman, Penguin, Riddler. Of yeah. the, like, those are just the main four to me. And outside of that, Riddler, we know by far the least about, which is the total enigma as it were hmm? <laughs> hmm? too much right on the nose, just the way I like it. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Well, what we do yeah. know about the Riddler is that he, uh, of course, for maybe you're a new listener, maybe you're just getting into Batman because you are a big RPAT 
you know, Stan, as the kids yeah. say. I don't know. You probably aren't because those would be Twilight kids that are our age anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, the Riddler is a supervillain appearing in comic books published by DC Comics, created by Bill Finger and Dick Sprang. First appeared in Detective Comics 140. That was released in October of 1948. Uh, commonly, the Riddler is depicted as a criminal mastermind, genius level intellect who has an obsession, you know, incorporates. Uh, riddles, of course, puzzles, jigsaws, uh, all sorts of different devices, and leaves clues and taunts the authorities in Batman. He's one of the most enduring villains of Batman's storied and legendary um, rogues gallery of rivals. So it's very fitting that the Riddler would show up in the first iteration of a new series of movies um, focused on the Batman. He's never been in the very first movie of a series. He, of course, was in Batman 1966, famously portrayed by uh, Frank Gorshman, for which he won an Emmy. Um, Outstanding. Uh, You mentioned Jim Carrey already, uh, essentially did like the 90s version of that same character. Um, But there have been different portrayals across the years. And Ryan, if you would be so kind, you picked out three stories for us to touch on for the listeners tonight. Uh, give us the intro on what we're going to be talking about. We're going to we're going to hit up a few, uh, a variety, if you will, of uh, famous Riddler stories. We're going to talk about his debut issue, um, in which he was nominated for an Emmy for a Oh geez, he didn't win. He didn't win, oh. which is which is how you knew that the Emmys were rigged way it's back rigged. in 1966. It's rigged, it's um, a crime. Detective Comics number 140, Riddler's debut. Also a story uh from Matt Wagner that was released in 1995 around the time of Batman Forever, for that reason. Uh the Riddler Factory. Or the Riddle Factory, I'm sorry. And then also his recent interpretation in Jeff Johns, Gary Franks, and Brad Anderson's Batman Earth One universe. Uh, the three very different versions of the character, but all have kind of the same through line in which we wanted to touch upon those three because it covers, I mean, between those three stories, that's uh, 65, 65 that's years. Years. A lot of years. Like just those three stories. And the character himself is uh, 70, what is it, 73 years old. But the, the span of those three stories is you know, like 65 years. So we wanted to talk about that and how Matt Reeves, who it's, I think he's kind of proven himself that he's a lot, he's been a lifelong fan of the Batman world. Uh, that, you know, how deep could he have maybe pulled for his characters, specifically the Riddler, going all the way back to 1948 in Detective Comics 140. Well, and also, you know, Ryan Lauer, you, as most listeners to this podcast will know, host your own podcast, The Batman Book Club. <gasps> I do. Which, which, of course, is, you know, you put together partly to inspire readers to read more Batman comics. Like you say, Batman every, comics. Oh, there it is. Every, every single time. And there are some, there are some um, choices you can make here. For instance, this Matt Wagner story, I had never read before. I mm-hmm. got to read it for the first time for this podcast. You could have easily said, hey, from that era, let's talk about watching Batman Forever, which I've seen, <laughs> I don't know, a billion times. Sure. Um, but I got to read something new. So I think it's a great choice. I, I'm sure a lot of listeners... Um, have probably read Detective Comics 140 or have seen it in reprint, but not everybody goes all the way back to 1948 for the back issues. Those are way back issues. And then, you know, very modern interpretation in a huge mega seller in Earth One, we have a little bit of a smattering of familiarity across the board too. So listeners, hopefully you get to uh, hear about something you haven't read before and go out and read something new because that's ideal. That's how we keep winning. So, Ryan, let's start at the very beginning. Let's follow continuity. Let's do this chronological order. Plus, the start is a great place to start. Detective Comics number 140. Why don't you give us a a introduction to the introduction of the character? How does the audience or the reader first meet Edward Nigma in this portrayal? Well, he was he was a young lad at he you know, there's a challenge to solve a jigsaw puzzle and 
he cheats, gives him an upper hand, gives him an advantage for his class. And he kind of continues to cheat and goes to a carnival and schemes his way into money um, by cheating with puzzles. And eventually he just gets, I mean, this is called about talk about the quickest turn of a villain. You know, he's like, I'm bored and decides I'm going to challenge Batman. And he's in full spandex. uh, Right. Advertising a crossword puzzle and heists on the sides of buildings. Uh, And and then that in no time at all, he turns into the Riddler that we kind of know um, that we know and love in that he loves the challenge of Batman and leaving, leaving these riddles that are, Yes, provide an answer, but his answer is a twist on the answer. So while it's not um, specific, so yes, Batman solved it. I'm trying to think of like the first a banquet uh, that comes to mind. Where yes, he, a bank a banquet. It it should read. Let's see, like oh, a it's fancy a, dinner. Right? Yeah, a so banquet. like a, a a banquet, a a basin or basin in a street. And then he puts them together and it's like, oh, a Basin Street banquet in which he goes. So, yes, that's correct. But bank wet as in bank bank. hyphen W.E.T. floods a bank. And that's so it's just like clever, a clever twist to a new character that stuck right away by Bill Finger. Um, And yeah, I think that that interplay that sticks to the character for now 73 years, you know, that's what we know as the Riddler. Totally. But, you know, I did not realize Ryan, and I know I've read this issue before. I know I read it as a child because I I got DC did a series of reprints of like some key issues looking at like villain origins and stuff like that, that I had. And I might've, might've actually, um, when I was a, a real youngster, checked out a hardcover version of a collected edition of villain origin stories out of my public school library. There you go. Mm-hmm. Education's yeah. vital. Uh, Get comics in schools. Come on. Anyways, yeah. carry on. Yeah, read more comics. But I know that I've read this issue before, but I hadn't read it in like years and years and years and decades. Mm-hmm. And rereading it for the podcast, what struck me right away was two things. The first, just what you were talking about with like sort of the word play and the riddles, where the riddles, when you solve them, weren't actually just the riddle. You had to kind of go to that next level for the riddle and think about like, okay, it's this, but what does this really mean? Because for me, I grew up watching the 66 series on rerun and syndication, like again and again and again. And I always thought, um, I I thought that's where that angle came from. I, I, you know, in my mind for years, the Riddler was more of a straight ahead trickster that then would get mad if someone solved it, not play by his own rules or try to work to bend the rules a bit. Yeah. But right from the get go, it was sort of like, you have to solve the clue behind the clue. I thought that was something that was developed probably decades later, but it, here it is right in the late forties. I, that was shocking to me, quite honestly, it's maybe a little bit embarrassing to admit as the host of a Batman podcast. I did not know that was there from the inception. Were you aware of this? uh, No. I, in which there's, it's just hard to, to really pinpoint where the impressions were left on. Cause most of my life Riddler's not just been only spandex. Like he's had the, he's had the hat and the the, coat and the hat and the cane. Yeah. He's had all of that. That was not from his, from his beginning, from his introduction. Um, this this way wasn't necessarily cheating, but version of Riddler that I knew is, or that I, in my mind, is that he doesn't cheat because yes. he, he wants, he wants that solid victory just for his ego to know the I'm ego better is so than big. Batman. Yeah, I'm, totally. You did not figure this out. Not... Oh, you figured it out, but then I still I tricked you anyway because then yeah, that's kind of totally. <laughs> and I wonder, I wonder if at some point, because you know I'm a few years older than you, 
Um, but we grew up reading comics at about the same time, watching, it, it, you know, modern yeah. media interpretation of the character at the same time, playing the same video games, blah, 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 all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm curious when that sort of changed because, it is very clear right away. One in the origin story as a child, yeah. Edward Nigma was like, Hey, I'm super smart, but I'm going to use my intelligence to figure out how to be a no good, dirty cheat. And as soon as he starts getting good at it, it inspires him not to just, you know, use his intellect and his ability to solve problems on its own. It, it inspires him to cheat better at how to do these things. So he's yeah. this phony fraud, but a very intelligent phony fraud from the mm-hmm. very beginning. Yeah. And that was that was a bit odd to me because I'm used to this sort of um, respecting the truth, almost like having this warped sense of virtuosity to the character that like is not here in the origin whatsoever. No. All the way skipping to the end to like, Hey, Batman, solve this maze. Oh, but if you solve it, I'm going to seal you in the maze anyway and try to blow you up. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, it, it was, I guess that's not what I'm used to from like, like the late they, 80s on. They didn't nail it out the gate. Fair. Maybe, maybe that's what happens when Bob Fair. Kane doesn't get involved. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Bob yeah. Kane saved all these characters. Yeah. Bob Kane um, to the rescue, the creator extraordinaire. <laughs> if only but, he would have been here to help old Edward. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay because I, I think a lot of characters get, you know, refined over time. Look at Batman himself, refined over time. So the idea of the Riddler that it, at his core introduced in Detective 140 is, you know, this character, you know, he's smart. He is a villain. Uh, he loves to challenge um, intelligence because he knows right. he, he wants to be the smartest guy in the room and then proposes these massive riddles, you know, for his schemes. So it's like that, that those seeds were planted and they've been there now for 73 years. Uh, that, that to me, that's the core of the, the Riddler character and then green of some kind. Yeah, uh, green. He's definitely green. He was green from, you know, the beginning in this issue. The costumes there right away. The question yeah. marks are there right away. The sort of modus operandi was not there quite right away, at least compared to some of the different versions that he's grown into. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit more like a benign, but sort of, I don't know. I mean, Definitely still dangerous, but not intentionally murderous version of the character. Like this felt like a little bit of a softer, just a little bit more careless, like criminally negligent version of the character to me. Did it read that way to you too? Or am I off in left field? Absolutely. He, he, he didn't feel that threatening because he was, he was in it to, to scheme, you know, fat in his pockets uh, Mm. for sport in a way. Cause it's not like there was much of an, an explanation for I'm going to do this so that I can buy myself a castle, you know, the design <laughs> of a puzzle and it's right. amazing or anything like that. I think it's just for sport for that, that ego boost, you know? So yet again, that lives weren't, didn't become at stake until later on either. Like there's definitely something that sticks of him along with, you know, like the Riddler and the other rogues that, that we know of, I, I don't go back to golden age Batman stories very often. It's t- telling of its time, uh, but a Riddler story, this one in reading it now, I don't know the last time I read it, but uh, I get holds up. It keeps my attention. Just like Joker's first appearance keeps my attention. Totally Random Joe Schmo criminal from the forties, those kind of Batman stories that, it's a little harder to get through. Yeah. So the, the comic story in right. Part of me yeah. were like, Hey, you need to understand your history and know where these things got to do the from. work. You got to do the Peter work. Peter Vero will turn on you. If you don't, Oh do my the work. gosh, if you don't do your work, <laughs> Peter M slash R Vera will <laughs> let you know, he will let you know. And he, he'll give you a reading list. It, it, that's if he likes you, if yeah. he doesn't like you, he just judges you. silently. <laughs> canceled. That's, You're that's just canceled. Tr- that's trouble. That's no good. That's like getting whacked by the mob. I don't want to talk about the mob. They scare me. Yeah. Forget about that. Yeah. Forget the sorry He's Jersey. Italian. Yeah. Sorry Jersey. Anyways. I 
the uh, uh, mucho respecto. I don't know. It's fake <laughs> mucho Spanish. respecto. Yeah, I actually speak Spanish. I don't know why he tried to pass that off as Italian. Um, but it, it, you know, it's sort of um, criminally negligent, willing to let people get hurt. But his focus is uh, Batman, 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 and money. Batman and money, Batman and money. I want to show that I'm smarter than Batman. I also want to get money. I don't necessarily need to kill people, but if people die because I'm going after Batman and proving that I'm smart or pro- proving that I'm smarter than Batman while I'm going after money, well, then they die. And, you know, but big, big deal, whatever. Not nice, but not necessarily the same way he's he's been presented in other areas. Not necessarily as malicious or, I don't know, uh, intentionally violent, I guess is not quite it either, but not sadistic, I guess is, is yeah. maybe the best word I can think of it. And I think this, this version, Frank Gorshin captured it for what they were going for in the 60 series. Uh, Jim Carrey, as we said in the 95 live action was doing a Frank Gorshin impression, but I think he strayed a little bit cause he did, he did leave clues and riddles for, for Batman to solve, which ultimately had a big, you know, reveal for him of Mr. Enigma. Right. But his brain waves to get smarter that way. It's like, that doesn't feel full on this Riddler character that we know, no. because that almost feels like a cheat and he's just trying to get knowledge. He's not fully on, full on trying to prove that he's smart. It's like, he's, He's yeah. trying to cheat. So he, he is very, very intelligent. His intelligence doesn't put him above willing to be dishonest. Or would you say that does fit in with Detective 140? Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's a it's quite the conundrum. Uh now puzzle the real to be solved. Game begins. we keep playing the real game you know in chronological order so we've got the origin the introduction of riddler in detective 140 yeah flash forward you know what just over 47 years i was say just under 50 years and this is a title as i said i'm really glad you suggested reading it batman riddler Riddle Factory. I was unfamiliar with it. It was released as a prestige format one shot in 1995. Alongside the a Two-Face one shot and the Batman Forever comic book adaptation. I have one of those. I don't have the Two-Face one shot. I have the Forever adaptation. It's uh, it's in pristine condition, just in case anyone's wondering. Excellent. And I've never opened it because the spine looks so nice. <laughs> and I've, I've, um, I have a, a beater copy that back of my mom's some. Mine, mine were read so much because <laughs> yeah, I got them for Christmas. That was my ninth. Ryan Lauer's ninth Christmas was one of the greatest Christmases of all time because that was that Batman was twelve Forever Christmas. Yeah. It was yeah. Batman Forever Christmas. I got the Batmobile. I got Batman Riddler, Two-Face. Two-Face came with a coin. Sure I carried did. that around and flipped it all the time. <laughs> you dork. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got Robin and Sue and Dick Grayson. Oh, I got so good. these comics. I got Batman Forever, a 3D board game, something under the big top. It was amazing. But these two comics, I still have. I don't have any of the other stuff. But these two comics I have because, you know, I always talk about uh, – I talk about on my show, a small town, Indiana didn't have a comic shop. No. So obviously, and it, it, we're old, so we can say this of, we didn't have streaming. You didn't have back in my day. the internet to do anything. It was, you could go to the library and what they have is all you get. Well, they didn't have comics at the library. So I had a nice little stack of single issues and barely any collected yeah. anything. And these were full on prestige format you know it's like yeah these were books these were were comics fancy yeah so i read those all the time and this one i read more than the the two-face one because this one actually this one scared me well i can't wait i want to pick your brain out because i've i've listeners i when i have an expert on the show i don't feel the need to necessarily have another guest coming no no it's still you (laughs) I don't feel the need to like fully become an expert myself. So I I read this once through and I have questions for Ryan because he's read this. So let me start with this. The year is 1995. This was, am I understanding it correctly? Like build as marketed as not a tie in, 
but sort of like we're going to put this book out there because Riddler is in the big new movie. Yeah, it's they did this. They did this with Returns too. Uh, Penguin, Absolutely. Tri- yep. Penguin Triumphant, and then I forget what the Catwoman story is, and then they followed it up and back. Batman and Robin did a Mr. Freeze, Bane, Batgirl, and Poison Ivy stories as well. Perfect. It's not Those meant are all to on be DC universe. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're getting more yeah. homework. So, anyway, this this wasn't meant to be Jim Carrey's Riddler. No. It was just let's put a big Riddler centric story out there because he is got a big bright shining spotlight on him because of this new movie, right? Mm-hmm. Now, so did this portrayal of Riddler? Um, and you just said you weren't able to get a bunch of issues, but looking back on it now, is this standalone? Was it meant to be in continuity? Do you know? Cause it felt, it felt like it could be very in continuity to me. Nothing said like else worlds one shot or something like that. Um, but do you know whether or not this was supposed to be in line with the other Batman books of its day? To me, I always read like it's standalone, but not definitely not Elseworlds anything. It wasn't. Right. Um, I mean, it didn't take place between Batman five twenty three and five twenty six or anything like that. It's this is just a you don't need to read anything before it or read anything after it. But sure, this is this happened. There's no reason that it, Riddler. Yeah, there's no reason that this couldn't have yeah. been post crisis Batman, post crisis Riddler. But precisely, you didn't need an editor's note to say, oh, uh, before this, make sure you catch, you know, like mm-hmm. Denny used to put those little boxes in um, at all. Okay, good. So that that's the way I read it, too. Now, Ryan, I can, can we play a game? Because I've got, I want to guess why you suggested Is it this. Battleship? One. No, it's not Battleship, but that would be okay. fun. We could do that yeah. sometime. It, you know, it's Friday, nothing to do. Why not? Because you know what I would say? I like this game. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. Delightful. That is I, of, of a movie with some ra- really random inclusions in it. That might be the most random inclusion of Batman forever. Spank me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, yeah. Joygasm. Spank me. Joy. Yeah. There's a I few. I like this game. The real game begins. It keeps me safe when I'm jogging at night. Okay. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I think I know why you suggested this one. Can I, can I, can I wager a guess? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So what hit me in this story. So first of all, listeners, this story is very focused on Riddler exposing the hidden truths and secrets of the upper crust of Gotham society and the rich elite. And from the, the kind of hints and teases from Reeves, the Batman, that seems like it's going to be a part of his version of the Riddler, his Riddler, it's not his version, in this movie, it is the Riddler. That feels like the connective tissue. Did I get it right, Ryan? You are correct. Ah! Yeah. so. I, I hope think, so. I, I mean, that to me was the, the connector uh, because the very little that we that We, we don't have a lot. With, with the upcoming movie, but then the, the most recent synopsis that, we, that came out I think right. last week, you know, even said, you know, hinted towards this. And so not only is it sadly, the Riddler doesn't have uh, like defining stories, I don't think, which is too bad because he's one of like, he's such a great character. And I mean, Joker's got a ton, you know, of Joker stories that you can seek out and Two-Face does and Penguin's got pain and prejudice and, uh, I think Riddler needs one. And this one, this one to me is always at the top, if not the top. Uh, and one of those is in that regard. Also, it, it shows the, <clears throat> maybe it, there's a lot more of this character now that we, characteristics of Edward Nigma that we associate with, like this comic has that. So, he's picking the rich and famous in which like even a, you know, a, a, a Bruce monologue, he's like, what does the Riddler hope to gain from all this? But what is the riddle? Where's the connection? Are the targets deliberate or random other than the fact they were both rich and famous. They were both famous and rich. So it's that to me is definitely just kind of connecting to, okay, well there's that one. Uh, Riddler is for some reason targeting the rich and famous 
Same thing, it seems, for this upcoming movie. Not to mention he looks like the Riddler that we've grown to be accustomed to. But he's also in in this comic doing the constant riddles and puzzles and stuff, which right. I think is what always attracts me to reading Riddler stories because I try to see if I can solve them and I can't. Oh, every I suck time. at riddles. I suck I, at riddles so bad. I'm I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm not awesome at them. I can normally figure them out. I'm good with like kids' riddles, like um, <laughs> laugh, laughy taffy riddles, you know, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I can figure out, okay, my kids will try to stump me and I just like, boom, take that nine year old intellect. Dad's smarter. Yeah. But I I think about it because I always want to see if I can solve the riddle. But then I also put myself in the writer's shoes. I'm like, all right, so Wagner, Matt Wagner in this case, that dude's just sitting there like, time to come up with a riddle, Matt. Like, does he go, <laughs> like, in 95, was he asking Jeeves? Like, asked Jeeves .com, <laughs> give me a riddle, like, search. All right, what is this? I, I thought, um, it's interesting you say the rich and famous angle because I can't think of a storyline and it's been, it's been referenced since it's shown up where um, there's sort of this covetous nature to Riddler. And maybe that's true of all criminals. Let's get philosophical for a second, but like where he has sought out the spotlight and like the flashiness really has became a huge element of the personality. So it's not just goofy. It's not just, a little zany. It's not just tricking and pulling pranks. And then oh, I'm going to prove that I'm smarter, but he wants the spotlight. He wants the audience. He, he talks about how important the theater is to him and the theatrics and putting on a show. Uh, so listeners, we haven't told you it throughout this, this issue, this mega side, you know, prestige issue, the Riddler is putting on basically hijacking like, I don't know if it's cable, cable access TV show or a regular broadcast. It must be because they're talking about FCC Public regulations. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and putting on his own sort of like, you know, creepy twisted um, game show. One where we find out no one actually gets hurt partially because maybe he's not, um, he's not like murderous or no one gets killed or anything like that but also because it keeps him just outside of the reach of the law from re really breaking any big deal crimes. So he's covering up for this other big crime, but he is wanting and coveting the wealth that in this story, he's ultimately trying to steal behind the ruse of this game show type thing. But he also is like very, very attention hungry, right? Like if you're going to steal a TV channel to make your own, you know, game show where you're the host and you've got flashy mm -hmm. costumes and everything else, and you're making yourself the center of attention, you've got an ego issue going on. I don't, I don't know. I guess there's not a comic book where those two things come together for me in my mind that I can think of in the same way prior to this issue that I've read in 95. Like the Batman forever. I always felt like, Oh, I never really thought of Riddler as needing to be the spotlight, needing to take the spotlight from Bruce Wayne, you know, wanting to be famous like Bruce Wayne. I always thought it was more intellectual in like a, a battle of wits, not a battle of who can get the paparazzi to pay attention to them. But am I, am I missing something or is this kind of unique or at the time unique to have this be the portrayal? I think I think you're on to something for sure. A little bit of a megalomaniac. Batman yeah. Forever, for sure. As soon as he sees, you know, Bruce and he does his hair different and then. Yeah, because the fake yeah, mole. Yeah. How's my mole? And, <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, he needs to be better than Bruce and he loves having that spotlight there. So I think that's just maybe a small little footnote in the Riddler's history. I'm not saying, and I mean, I guess a little bit of it's in Scott Snyder's zero year. I was going to say zero year, man. He's putting himself on giant, like, you know, billboards and the whole deal. Yeah. And I think in animated series, there's a bit of that. So maybe, I mean, but maybe that that's why it feels to me like something that's familiar. And I don't know when it kind of came into the character because it would have yeah. come into the character and, you know, my preteen years and been there ever since. Now, let me ask you this, because I said in these episodes, we'll talk about what we think will be in the movie and won't be in the movie. I, at least so far, get the impression that that is not a motivation for the Batman's The Riddler. I don't know that he's seeking the spotlight. 
like now, from the I, mask and the whole deal. <laughs> I don't know. I have I have no clue here. Uh, Total speculation. Something just tells me we haven't seen. There was. I just feel like there's going to be another outfit for the Riddler in the Batman. Oh, you think so? I think so. I don't know why. I just I think so because what we've seen, the little that we've seen, is so drastically different. True. Uh, I feel like there's just going to be. I don't know. I could be completely wrong. And if so, you know, tweet me that I was wrong. I don't know. Whatever. Um, Save those are receipts. <laughs> but it doesn't but, have to be crazy, right? It could just be like a leather jacket with a question no, mark on of it. Course. You know, like it could because, be anything. I mean, as we just talked about with the Riddler's initial um, characteristics in, in his debut, it's like what's the through line is his intellect, his challenging Batman, um, you know, mentally. As long as that's there and there's some form of green, to me, that's yeah, that's the yeah. Riddler because he didn't become the the suit type for many years, many, many years after the fact as it is. So he can't even say that that's the defining look of the Joker because for the first how many years he was in full on leotard. Yeah, just a <laughs> gymnastics onesie. And I think, you know, th- that's really true. Um, you know, there's some characters that – really didn't go through a definitive change in the way that we think about the Riddler. So, you know, again, got you know, people of our age might have a view of what the Riddler is. That's probably influenced by the animated series and Batman forever. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, younger folks, maybe the next book we'll talk about, but before that he, you know, wasn't necessarily the, the same, the same dude, whereas Joker came out fairly fully forged. Right. Mm-hmm. Catwoman's had costume changes, but you know, hasn't there was like this period of time in the 50s and 60s where she had like a skirt kind of and it was different, but it, it hasn't been that far off. Penguin's kind of been the penguin, except for DeVito. Like, but what we think of as the archetypical Riddler is a fairly new creation. And it's not, it didn't happen too much earlier than this is, issue right here. So I thought I thought it was a good selection. I enjoyed the read. I played well. It's a lot of Riddler. It's a little heavy on the Riddler, a little light on the bats, but that's just fine. Uh, this is a villain focused episode. So it makes sense to talk about a villain focused comic book. And I, I like the kind of quest behind the quest. You know, you think about in this issue, the Riddler is actually looking for a long lost treasure and he's using the game show full of riddles as a front to find this thing. So it's sort of like the mission behind the obvious thing. It makes me curious, along with the connection to sort of uncovering the secret hidden, you know, inner lives of Gotham's elite, if in the Batman, there will also be, you know, Paul Dano's just trying to get paid somehow or, you know, fine. There's something underneath. I mean, you look at back the the first issue we even talked, there's a little bit more underneath the surface of the answer. Yeah. Uh, In this comic, uh, you know, the Riddle Factory, there's something beneath the surface of the answer. And the Batman, is it, I mean, it's a powder keg, Riddler's a match. Right. So what's, like, what is he starting? Like, what's under the surface? So, I mean, there's an, maybe it's a stretch that I'm, and I think what we're about to jump to. I I was going to say, I don't think it is a stretch, Ryan, because that comes up in this next one, too. Yeah. I So I just want, before we move on to that one, I just want to say, if you haven't read The Riddle Factory, track it down and read it because you won't be disappointed. It's, it's a very fun comic. Um, c- the connections that we just said of like it, the way it might be connected to the Batman, but also, I mean, it's kind of fun. It scared the hell out of me as a kid because some of these traps for the people in the the game show, I it think were kind of horrifying. Stinking uh, rabbit <laughs> raccoon in a glass cage. With you. Rabbit oh, raccoon, thank you. A woman sitting in front of a massive trumpet, a guy sitting uh, ready to be uh springed into i mean all yeah. that stuff but then but then i i really liked like the riddles because i kind of miss i think you know in some other stories uh riddler stories the the riddle i think felt like a stretch sure i think in zero year I'll, they felt like a stretch and, and see, i'm i love I mean, snyder it, zero year is not his best work but i I mean i love him he's genius there's parts I, of that i like I, I the riddle stuff could use a little help the I mean, riddle me this. How does an ex- exhibitionist garbage collector break up with his girlfriend? The answer, he dumps, dumps her, her in public. In public. 
I mean, you you got to have like a ah, uh, like, wacky like, taffy, some, man. Those to me are like the effective riddles, not like here's a here's a six sentence paragraph answer, and which at the end you're kind of scratching your head. Which sometimes yeah. I feel like is where we've gotten with the Riddler a little bit. Totally, so that kind of fun stuff is sprinkled throughout, as well as Batman and Gordon teaming up and taking down the Riddler and stuff. So it's a great comic. Definitely track it down if you haven't uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, there you go. I love it. Check it out. And I think this next comic, probably many of you have checked out because it's a best seller, uh, New York times, bestseller, a bestseller on Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, a, a really high quality effort and follow up by Jeff Johns and Gary Frank to the, you know, groundbreaking, Batman Earth One Volume One is Batman Earth One Volume Two. I can't believe I got that right. Normally, I always say Year One in there at some point, and I didn't do it. But I still mentioned that I normally do it because I want to be honest. You're evolving. Yeah, you know what else? It's kind of (laughs) nice. So the Riddler makes his appearance in Earth One Volume Two. uh, Actually, makes his first appearance at the very end of Earth One Volume One. But Volume Two is the Riddler story and. Ryan, we both kind of um, it kind of clicked into our brains at the same time. There is more to be. There's more to this character than is to be seen. Um, there's a thing behind the thing in this iteration once again. But in this iteration in particular, we get what we have not seen, specifically not seen. Really, it's called out where the Riddler doesn't care if people die. Uh, He just is more interested in beating Batman and stealing money in his first appearance. They actually go out of their way to say the Riddler isn't killing people because he doesn't want to like go too far and get arrested uh, largely because he doesn't want to get arrested before he can find this treasure we mentioned. But in, in earth one uh, Ryan, this guy is pretty okay with killing people. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, and I think in a trait that goes back to his origin is he doesn't mind kind of breaking his own rules and cheating for his ultimate goal. And bingo, that bingo. that to me, does it work for the story? Absolutely. I like the story overall. Now let's nitpick the character, and I'm like, ah, that's not, to me, that doesn't work as much for the Riddler at hand. Well, I mentioned the fact personal preference totally, but I mentioned the fact that you are the librarian of the Batman book club. Oh goodness. And I don't know uh, if you listeners know this, I'm guessing most of you do because you probably, you know, taken all the back content you can just the way I do. Uh, I was just lucky enough to cover the earth one books with Ryan on his podcast. And not too long ago, I, I think it was this year, right? Was it early this year? We talked about early two this or, year. Yeah. Like February. Um, we talked about earth one volume two. And I remember specifically, uh, and we can tweet out the the link to that show. If you're interested in checking out it's, I mean, not because of me, because of Ryan, it was a good one. Um, <laughs> Us Midwesterners chatting it up, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just having a great time. But I remember calling out specifically that one of my nits to pick on that story was that I don't like a cheating Riddler, yeah. like a Riddler that his intelligence is so all consuming. His ego is so strong that he would never think to cheat Batman because he has to break him and beat him straightforwardly. Now, it doesn't mean he's not going to break laws and it doesn't mean he's not going to, you know, ultimately have some underhanded other plan, but he's not going to outright cheat in the, in the challenges itself. But in Earth One Volume Two, the Riddler is a straight up, you know, secretive, mysterious serial killer. And he is yeah. out murdering people in Gotham. He's trying to get Batman's attention. Um, but he has some other stuff going on in those murders, masking his true intents, um, that he's not just blindly killing anyone and everyone. He also has a plot at hand. This to me, Ryan. Um, based on what we've seen, the two trailers, the synopsis feels likely the closest. It's also the most recent, the most modern, which would make sense because the Batman is looking like a very modern approach to, to the character in, in his world. But this feels like where I, if I, I had to wager a guess, 
what do you think was the most direct inspiration? I would say this, but dang, this I the the previous idea of going after Gotham's elite and in, in, in exposing their secrets was was pretty good too. But this more serial killer, based on some of the violence we've seen, based on some of the comments Reeves have made, I'm guessing it's this Riddler. I don't know. We haven't seen a lot, but that's where the breadcrumbs are leading me. We we know that Matt Reeves has read Batman Earth One because uh, the line that Batman says, "I'm vengeance," right? That's out of it. directly from Batman Earth One. From this, Jeff John's hand to that's Robert right. Pattinson's mouth. I don't know. That sounds bad, <laughs> but whatever. That sounds bad. And you know what? I'll allow it. I'm okay with it. Uh, but yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. He's a he's a, a scary serial killer. Yeah. In the Earth One universe. And all signs are pointing that is the version that we're getting in the Batman. So I just feel the the modern take, like you said, the serial killer, he's scary, the the realistic approach, all of that definitely feels like what we're gonna see here in three months as well. So maybe I mean, and then kind of like you said too, of the underlying uh, mission at hand, he's got more going on than what. Yeah, something else behind it. Like he's yeah, also he, trying to. There's something else. There's another layer. Um, the the Riddler is like onions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you cut him, sorry, you cry. I don't know. He's like he's like ogres. Let's just say that. You know, maybe that's easier <laughs> to understand. Nice. You know? That's good. Yeah, he's just, he's just like an also, ogre. <laughs> Also a green reference. <laughs> yeah, it's all connected. It's all connected. Oh my god. <laughs> um that's what I take from Earth One, which may not seem like it's as much, but there there just definitely is something in when I reread that this year and then seeing I reread it after last year's fandom trailer and then having that sort of still in my in my mind, seeing this year's fandom trailer, it just there is something like I feel like it's in the same vein. It's somewhat yeah. relative, um, which there's a few, you know, as I mean, as we just talked about the previous two stories and the, then this one, you know, there's elements of the Riddler that's present here. Um, I know that there's a debate on online and everybody is totally entitled to their own opinion. It's perfectly fine that what we've seen of this Riddler aesthetically some people don't like it. Some people do. I say if it works for the story, then awesome. Uh, there's more to the Riddler than a hat and a coat because he wasn't even wearing that when he for, for his first like 30 years. Um, it's not my preferred look, but there's more to the character than just a static image that we see. Yeah. And him him duct taping somebody's face. <laughs> oh, geez, uh, no kidding. It's pretty it, intense. And I mean, it's lining up by the very little bit that we know here of that through line of what we're talking about. There's certain things that it just seems that's hitting Riddler stories. All right. So it's, it let's, seems let's, like that's what we're getting. Let's let's think about. Let's think about what those are. So we got volume two here of Earth one. Um, the character's got question marks. He wears a green jacket. Um, he uses riddles. In this scenario, and correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't reread this right before we recorded because I've reread it. I've read it like two or three times this year. But off the top of my head, I don't remember. I think the majority of his riddles are actually pointed at his victims who he ultimately kills right before. Like he's riddling them right before he leads them to their deaths or causes their deaths. So there's riddles there. In the, in the trailer so far, it seems as if the Riddler is uh, pointing his riddles towards the police and towards Batman. We don't know if he's also riddling his victims because we haven't seen, you know, very, we've seen two, yeah. two trailers at this point. But that feels like a bit of a difference. In, in Earth One Volume Two, for the public at large, it felt like the, um, the key thing about the Riddler was that he was a serial killer, not a Riddler. <laughs> like the riddles to the public at large were not the thing. It was the fact that people, someone is killing people, right? Mm-hmm. I wonder if that will be the case 
in um, the Batman. And not because he's not actively utilizing riddles, but because the riddles are pointed at um, the police and Batman, you know, similar to the Zodiac killer or, you know, you're a horror guy. Um, you know, the the uh, Saw movies where the the riddles aren't something that everybody knows about. Certainly people are aware that people are dying. I don't know if the Saw thing works out. I only saw the first one. They were too scary for me. I didn't watch anymore. <laughs> it was really gross. You know, that guy was dead on the ground the whole time. No, thanks. Uh, but <laughs> but I, it feels like it could be more in line with this comic, with those you know, modern day um, serial killer movies, even if they're about serial killers from the past, than Riddler as we, yeah. you know, typically have him in our mind as, you know, yeah, a lot of 80s babies, 90s kids, 90s kids are the ones complaining I because they're on social media more more than anyone else. But it, it, is it just a twist? Is it just a version of that same thing? But a lot of the same goodness is there. In my mind, it is. In my mind, it is. I'm, go- I'm going into it with an open mind. I think I can see enough influences when you can point at a book from the 40s, a book in the 90s, and a book in the 2000 teens. Yeah. And I can say, ooh, I bet there's something like this in that. Or I bet there's a little bit of that in there. That to me means it's the Riddler. It might not yeah. look like the Riddler I've always seen, but that to me means it's the Riddler. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, what do I add? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Midwest brain <laughs> on the same page. You know, I, I, I never saw the Riddler with the flat top before 1995. And I don't remember anybody being too upset about that flat top. Mm, I remember Penguin? always, always wondering how did he go from that back to his brown hair? So oh yeah. I wondered what was the wig scenario? Like the, yeah. the, the, the like logic, like what not, the not even like, Jim Carrey. I'm talking about Edward Nigma in the movie. Yeah. How did he no, keep going in the movie. back and forth? And yeah. then how did he keep his little mask on his on his face? Because that's always been the question for me, though, with the domino masks. Like, and you know what? Like, right now we have too many questions. Too many questions. Too many questions. Too many questions. So in in Earth One Volume Two, mm-hmm. we we have this vendetta against Batman and not just Batman. We have a vendetta of the Riddler, you know, and that's really the motivation behind why he's killing these individuals. He's had a personal connection. Do you believe Ryan, knowing that what we believe is the Riddler going after the, the upper crust of, um, you know, wealth and society in Gotham, do you think there's a chance that that's that Edward Nashton is from that world? And is in his um, a peer or a contemporary or a compatriot of those rich people that we think he might be taking down, or is this some sort of class warfare? It's pure speculation. I know we're off on a wild goose chase here. Just what do you think so far? Is he somebody that's looking to take down the fat cats, or is he an angry fellow fat cat taking out other people just like him? I don't. I don't think he's a fellow fat cat. He's got an axe to grind against him. Maybe maybe a former reason. fat cat? Is he a fat cat who's become skinny? Is he an Atkins cat? Some, uh, some fast cat? Yeah, slim side like that better than Atkins cat. From fat cat I, to slim fast cat. That's good. <laughs> That's good. You win. You win. I don't, oh, stop it. Um, I don't know. Pure speculation. Because, I mean, it would also be creepier. Like, I just watched a movie called Funny Games. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I don't like your scary stuff. Okay. Well, this is not necessarily scary, but it, it, I mean, it kind of was. And it was originally, I think, a German film from 97. And then the sounds same, scary. The it sounds same, terrifying, <laughs> to be honest. I'm horrified just by the concept. The same director then remade it, but in America a decade later. Okay. Uh, and basically, it is, it's spoil. It seems, I mean, their appearance seems like upper echelon rich spoiled brats kids Mm -hmm. who just like to toy with rich families okay and torture and murder that doesn't sound there's something that's really scary about that too because you there's you can see a reasoning of 
if somebody is, you know, the lower class and they see the upper class is doing shady deals behind it, manipulating the system. Yeah, the but one percent on lower right? occupy yeah. Wall Street type thing. That then makes sense because it is like this is uh unjustly, you know, like th- that's not fair. So yeah. you can at least see retribution where from. type thing. Somebody on the same level doing that. There is like, well, then what's the reason? Yeah, and we're, at, we're at such an we're at such an age now that we need explanations. We need the reasons for everything to happen. Where it it can be kind of scary. Have you ever seen The Strangers? Yes, because okay. you were home. No, that was <laughs> that's Brian, the reason. You no, know, I don't like horror movies. <laughs> I don't even like you reminding me of horror movies that I watched one time because my friends made me and I was terrified. We watched yeah. that on a Halloween night in 2009, I want to say. I have not watched it since. I'm As upset. a scary movie. As a scary movie. But this isn't the, the BOF horror show. Yes. Yeah, oh yep. boy. But, <laughs> I, but, but look at that of like, why are you doing this? Because you were home. Because you are home. That's creepy. That's scary as hell. It's- so... What if this Edward Nash, which I don't feel like Reeves is going to leave something completely open, like there's going to be a reason for it, but like how kind of scary is that? I mean, I don't. It's scary don't know. when it it's feels random when there's not a motivation. Yeah. Even if but, even if we even if we hate the motivation, even if it's testable, the fact that there's reasoning makes us feel like it's okay. It's you know like. Yeah. Joker in the Dark Knight. You know, if there's a plan, mm-hmm. everybody can feel pl- okay about the plan. Even if it's terrible, but if it's all part of the plan. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as something happens randomly, what's he say? Everyone loses their minds. Everybody, yes, quite. Yeah. So I've seen the movie twice in my life. Yeah, I saw it once <laughs> in the theater, and I think I have it on DVD someplace. Okay. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you guys you know call yourself a fan, Greg. Listeners know better than that. Um, All right. But uh, that was just a roundabout. I mean, like you said, with pure speculation, it would be it would be creepy. It would if we don't know the reason, which we didn't even touch upon the I mean, it's hard to find information that Reeves went with Edward Nashton, not yeah. Edward Nigma. So I mean that's curiouser and curiouser, said Alice. And different villain. Yeah. <laughs> D- different rumor. That's Peter Vera's Batwoman reviews. Read them on BOF. Okay, Alice. Right. Anyways, um, but yeah, we didn't even touch on that. But I mean, that came, I think, post crisis. Uh, and that's interesting to try and consider, too. The, the main point is that we don't we don't have a clue for the, this version coming into Batman. But we can hint because we picked three. We just talked about three Riddler stories and there are similarities to the character of Riddler in each story. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter the era. There are things that ring true. Most of the time he has a secondary motivation behind the most obvious motivation. There are riddles and tricks and puzzles involved. Um, you know, money is a motivating factor in a bunch of these. So taking down what, and, and you know, whether what we know about it, whether he's motivated to take their money or just to separate them from their money and their lives in the Batman, uh, the target is the rich. So there's a lot of through lines here that even if he's mm-hmm. got a, you know, goofy, um, I don't know what the Pulp Fiction-esque mask. I don't know if it's goofy. It's kind of terrifying. Zodiac mask. Yeah, Zodiac uh, mask. You name it. Yeah, trench coat, military trench coat. <laughs> type thing. Uh, you know, he's there's some green. There's a question mark, multiple question marks, even in his latte. Uh, this, is the, this is the Riddler that we're getting. This is the Riddler that Matt Reeves has set up for us. And... I think there's enough common denominators across these different iterations that we've looked at in the comic books to tell us, yeah, this is, this is not a version of the Riddler. This is the Riddler for the Batman. He's not to be trifled with. <laughs> there you go. You Ryan. can quote so, quotes from Batman movies and everything in life. You can just plug them so in many. wherever you want. <laughs> you can plug them in wherever you want. And Ryan, speaking of plugins, I would love for you oh. as we start to wrap up the conversation here. Um, give us some plugs. One, thank you as always for coming back. It's a pleasure. Thank you for um, introducing Batman Riddler uh, Riddle Factory to me. Thanks for uh, giving me um, a nudge to go back and reread Detective Comics 140, which had been, I mean, quite honestly, decades. 
Um, and thank you for your intelligent thoughts as always. Where can people hear more of them? Ah, bless you, Garrett. Uh, it's been a really fun conversation. Uh, you can you can follow me personally on Twitter at Lauer underscore Ryan. Lauer spelled like lower, where I'll always try and tweet out anything that I post to batmanonfilm.com, which is usually comic book reviews, movie reviews, uh, Lego set reviews, no Batwing boy. lamp reviews, interview, oh, yeah. my pride and joy. Uh, my one-on-one interview with Lee Mayo, as well as my joint interviews with Bill and Mike Ramey with the Long Halloween screenwriter, Tim Sheridan. Awesome, awesome interviews for an awesome guy. Check those out. Uh, you can also follow my podcast, The Batman Book Club, a podcast exploring the Dark Knight Library. Um, you can follow that on Twitter at the Batman BC. Bill is also extremely kind in that he posts every episode on on BOF as well. So you can go to find that on BOF too. The most recent episode that just dropped was wrapping up the month of November with our pal, Peter R. Barra, the Italian. Head of the mob. Anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah. So talk about him. It's too dangerous. Yeah. So uh, yeah, check, check that out on the interwebs. And uh, you, thank you. You well, thank you. And also you have an interview uh, with somebody that uh, maybe voiced the character we talked about for this entirety of the episode, <gasps> too, correct? Uh, Wally Winger, yes. Uh, Ryan Haas and I, the sheriff, we we both interviewed Wally Winger, the voice of the Arkham Riddler. Yeah, uh, he so was good. awesome. That was a good hour and a half conversation. That's way back. Oh my goodness, that's like what two three years ago. One fifty podcast one fifty eight, I think. Yeah, in like November of twenty nineteen ish. Twenty nineteen. Something, yeah. yeah, around there. That was an that was an awesome interview. He was he was great, uh, given so much insight on behind the scenes with the Arkham games. Um, so, list, yeah, check that out too. We should tweet that out e- along with this. Either I should I'll I'll include that in the link um or in the description. Listeners either go back and listen to that again or listen to it for the first time. Really, really good podcast in there. It was it was fun. It, it, it stood it's, you know stood out to me as one of the highlights of the podcast for the last couple of years. So and very very well, thematic. that was one that I think at the very end, we just asked him, uh, could you just say you're listening to Batman on film in your Riddler voice? Oh, my gosh. Said, yeah, sure. And then he went above and beyond. And that's all I'll say about it. And then Haas and I just laughing and we're total nerds. He's like, oh, my God, that was so cool. <laughs> I feel like I should get that and edit it in for this episode. Who knows if I can find it? I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> Well, Ryan, thanks for coming and thanks for sharing your thoughts. As always, it's just one of my favorite things, having a conversation with you. And listeners, I love to keep the conversation going. And you can do that by following The Batman on film. That is at The Batman on film, all one word, over at Twitter. That's where you're going to get the latest news updates, um, information about articles, interviews, reviews, uh, things we know about the upcoming movie anything batman on film will pop into your timeline when you follow that account to do that and you can follow me personally over at garrett wado that is at g-a-r-r-e-t-w-a-t-o if there's anything you'd like to hear about on this podcast i told you kind of what we're going to do over the next few months but if there's anything else any ideas any feedback any reviews any criticisms any questions for guests any of that stuff you can email me at garrett.grev at batmanonfilm.com that is g-a-r-r-e-t dot g-r-e-v at batman dash on dash film.com and before we leave i always like to remind you so i think it's really important it's an important thing to me i think it's an important thing for us to keep in mind dear listeners it's not who you are underneath but it's what you do that defines you until next time thank you for listening farewell You have been listening to the official podcast of the one and only Batman on Film website. On Twitter, follow BOF at Batman on Film and the Batman Podcast Network at BatPod Network. For Jet and everyone at Batman on Film, I'm announcer Rachel. Thanks for listening to the authoritative, definitive, the original Batman on Film.